Tax credits are incentives provided by governments to encourage specific activities or behaviors that align with their economic, social, or environmental goals. Unlike tax deductions, which reduce the amount of taxable income, tax credits reduce the amount of tax liability. However, tax credits can also be dollar for dollar, meaning that they can be used to offset tax liability or provide a direct refund to the taxpayer. This article will explore the concept of tax credits as dollar for dollar incentives and highlight their benefits and limitations. What are tax credits? Tax credits are government provided incentives designed to encourage specific activities or behaviors that align with national, regional, or local goals. Tax credits can be provided at the federal, state, or local level, and they can be non-refundable or refundable. Non-refundable tax credits reduce the amount of tax liability owed by the taxpayer but cannot provide a refund if the tax liability is already zero. For example, if a taxpayer owes $5,000 in taxes and receives a $1,000 non-refundable tax credit, their tax liability would be reduced to $4,000 but they would not receive a refund of the remaining $1,000. Refundable tax credits, on the other hand, can provide a refund even if the tax liability is already zero. For example, if a taxpayer owes $5,000 in taxes and receives a $1,000 refundable tax credit, their tax liability would be reduced to zero, and they would receive a refund of the remaining $1,000. Refundable tax credits are sometimes referred to as negative taxes because they can result in a net payment to the taxpayer. Dollar for dollar tax credits Dollar for dollar tax credits are a specific type of tax credit that provides a direct refund to the taxpayer, regardless of their tax liability. Dollar for dollar tax credits are designed to provide a direct financial incentive to taxpayers, even if they do not have a tax liability. Dollar for dollar tax credits can be used to incentivize a wide range of behaviors and activities, including energy efficiency, renewable energy, education, and healthcare. For example, the federal government provides a dollar for dollar tax credit for the installation of solar panels on homes and businesses. This tax credit provides a direct financial incentive to homeowners and businesses to invest in renewable energy, regardless of their tax liability. Benefits of Dollar for Dollar Tax Credits Dollar for Dollar Tax Credits provide a direct financial incentive to taxpayers, regardless of their tax liability. This means that even taxpayers who do not owe any taxes can benefit from these incentives. This can be especially beneficial for low-income households, who may not have a significant tax liability but may still be interested in investing in energy efficiency, renewable energy education, or healthcare. Dollar for dollar tax credits can also be more effective than non-refundable tax credits in incentivizing specific behaviors or activities. Non-refundable tax credits only provide a benefit to taxpayers who have a tax liability, which means that they may not be effective in incentivizing behaviors or activities among low-income households or individuals who do not owe taxes. Dollar for dollar tax credits, on the other hand, provide a direct financial incentive to all taxpayers, regardless of their tax liability, which can make them more effective in encouraging specific behaviors or activities. Limitations of Dollar for Dollar Tax Credits While Dollar for Dollar Tax Credits can be effective in encouraging specific behaviors or activities, they also have some limitations that need to be considered. Firstly, Dollar for Dollar Tax Credits can be expensive for the government to implement. Unlike non-refundable tax credits, which only reduce tax liability, dollar-for-dollar dollar tax credits provide a direct financial incentive to taxpayers, which means that the government needs to budget for the cost of these incentives. This can be a significant expense, especially if the tax credit is widely used. Secondly, dollar-for-dollar dollar tax credits can be complex to administer. Refundable tax credits require additional documentation and verification processes to ensure that the taxpayer is eligible for the credit. 
This can increase the administrative burden for the government and make it more difficult for taxpayers to apply for and receive the credit. Thirdly, dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credits may not be equally beneficial to all taxpayers. High-income households may benefit more from these tax credits because they have a higher tax liability and therefore can receive a larger refund. This can result in a regressive distribution of the benefits of dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credits, where the wealthiest taxpayers receive a disproportionate share of the benefits. Conclusion Dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credits can be an effective tool for governments to incentivize specific behaviors or activities. Unlike non-refundable tax credits, which only reduce tax liability, dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credits provide a direct financial incentive to taxpayers, which can make them more effective in encouraging specific behaviors or activities. However, these tax credits can be expensive to implement and administer, and may not be equally beneficial to all taxpayers. Governments need to consider these limitations when designing and implementing dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax credits to ensure that they are effective and equitable incentives. It is a fact that most people are clueless when it comes to taxes, and the reason being is that in our society, we are taught to fear taxes. Throughout history, taxation has been a source of contention between the people in the government for which operates over the people. In 1933, the government seemingly provided a remedy for that, they in exchange for the ability to regulate the possession of gold in the country. And not just the currency, gave the people an insurance policy, the government stated that notes, drafts, bills of exchange and bankers' acceptances were to be at par with Federal Reserve notes and National Bank notes, to be receivable and redeemable by all member banks. The government became obligated, and they stated the following. We have provided that any direct obligations of the United States or any notes, drafts, bills of exchange, or bankers' acceptances acquired by Federal Reserve Banks may be deposited with the Treasurer of the United States or with the Federal Reserve agents, and upon these securities, Federal Reserve notes may be issued. In case of the deposit of the obligations of the government, the issue of Federal Reserve notes may be for the entire amount of such securities. Yes, there is no mistake in it, the government made provisions and all provided for the redemption of promissory notes, bills of exchange and other like instruments. The problem is, that today most people are unaware of this, and ignorance begets tyranny. So, what does a person have to do? The first thing is, the people must recognize, that the government promised to provide, now since, money is used to buy in the necessities of life, when the government took away that ability in 1933. They obligated themselves, and documented such, by stating that they made provisions available to the people respecting their necessities of accessing money. If you are in debt, 9 times out of 10 it is not your fault. Remember, so long as the emergency is ongoing, and Congress has documented such by the National Emergency Act of 1976 as well as the NDAA, no individual may be held liable for such debt, and thus the provision for writing off or cancelling such obligations. House note, your car note, your insurance, your student loans, your food, electric bill, gas bill, water bill, even your dog food or your cat food you may write off as a business expense, how so? While the agreement with government known as the New Deal, the contract with government, and because it was with the nation it involves national business. It is a business agreement, and as indicated in the following cases it is done to distinguish the natural person from the corporation. In Ray, Chase Manhattan Bank, 585 F.2D 1087, 1090, 2D Sir, 1978, First National Bank of Boston v. Blotti, 435 U.S. 765, 784, 1978. At V. FCC, 487 F.2D 865, 870 to 71, 2D Sir, 1973, Bank of America National Trust and South, Asin V. 203 North LaSalle Street Partnership, 
526 US 434, 439, 1999. State V. JL Manufacturing Co. 92S.E.2D 177, 180, NC 1956, State V. Swift. 276 and W 789 792 WIS 1938 State B Superior Coat in and for Maricopa County 582 P.2D 496 500 Arizona CT App 1978 Secretary of State of Maryland B J H Blades and Co 344 the US 443 447 to 48 1953 Royal Drug Co V State Board of Equalization 87 P.2D 197 201 California 1939 Expert A McIver 6S.W.2D 471, 474, Tex. Crim. App. 1928. State V. Standard Oil Co. of Louisiana, 88 So. 839, 846 to 47, Lao 1921, Hammond Packing Co. V. Arkansas, 212 U.S. 322, 350, 1909. Southern Rye, Co. V. Commonwealth of Kentucky, 231 U.S. 630, 636, 1914, Flashman Distilling Corporation V. Maya Brewing Co., 386 U.S. 714, 720 to 21, 1967. Bank of United States v. Planters Bank of Georgia, 22 U.S.904, 907 08, 1824. PPG Indus. Incorporated v. Webster Auto Parts Incorporated, 128 F.3D 103, 107, 2D Sir, 1997, RR Street and Co. v. Manufacturers and Merchants Bank of Pittsburgh, 19F, 382, 388 to 89, CCW Depa, 1884. People v. Comstock, 78 NW 371, 373, Meech, 1899, State v. Blackwell. 45 SE 262, 263, and C 1903. Each of these cases establish that the use of the all capitalized name, i.e., the name and all capital letters or all caps name, is not only act policy but it's a practice by the states to distinguish the natural person from the corporation. So, when the government places your name and all capital letters, these cases demonstrate that the government is aware that that name does not represent a natural person. So, that is a business, and as a business it is permitted to write off its bad debt and or business expenses and or net operating losses for the Internal Revenue Code and the special provisions provided for by the Internal Revenue Service. That being the case, you may write it off as a business-related expense as defined in IRS Tax Topic 453. You simply fill out a 1099-C form, keeping your receipts, incorporating a statement explaining the aforementioned, and sending it to the IRS. If you file electronically, you want to keep these documents on hand should anyone question with your doing. Any taxes presumed and or assumed outstanding with the Internal Revenue Service will be offset against the credit balance, and if done properly could equate to a person being tax-exempt for the rest of their existence. This process also helps to reduce the national debt to manageable levels, so tax credits, do your research on it, get a better understanding of it, because it could save you a bundle before you know. That's all we have created today, thanks for joining us.
and come back here soon to find out more on related topics.